Welcome to another episode of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I am Anthony Cazenza, joined as usual on my far right, John Sheeran, my co-host. John, how you doing, bud? I'm doing great because, for once, I'm the second oldest person on this podcast when we have a guest. Oh great to have someone who's a little bit younger than me, so I'm really excited about that. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're making me feel super old, so that that sucks. But I am super amped up because we have... The first member of the Bengals draft class to join us on this program, Marcus Bailey, one of the most exciting players of the class, one I'm very amped up to have on the sh- on the show. Marcus, how you doing, man? How you holding up through all this uh, wackiness that's going on in the world? Hey, let me get my let me get my camera all set up. We're all good. But, <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm um, I'm holding up pretty well. Uh, you know, it's like I said, this is uh, unprecedented in times, and you know, everyone's I've heard you probably heard that a million times at this point, but. Yeah. Um, everyone's been been forced to adapt to this to this to this scenario, and uh, it's very unfortunate. And my family and myself have, have been doing the been doing the best we can, following all the protocol. Um, but I've been I've still been able to you know get my work in and uh, continue to get my body ready for the season. And um, you know I'm excited that I'm a Bengal. You know of course now I know now I know where I'm going to be living at and going to be playing at. So um, you know just taking it day by day at this point. Well, fans are really excited, and um, from our standpoint, we're very excited to have you on the on the team, and um, you know what you're going to bring to the table. Uh, let's start kind of a little bit with the pre-draft process, given the unique landscape that we were just talking about and what you've had to endure. Uh, you know, yours is a, is a little bit of a special case because of the injury situation you had. You were hoping to use that pro day to really elevate your status, but um, talk a little bit if you can uh, with the pre-draft process, the interviews with the Cincinnati Bengals and, and maybe some of the things that they were asking you, if you're able to share that with us uh, in some of those pre-draft interviews. Yeah. So um, like you said, the, the pre-draft process did affect me. Uh, I mean, or when the COVID did affect the pre-draft process um, in terms of my ability to go to facilities and to actually be in, um, have teams see me in person for my pro day. Um, but my first interaction with the Bengals was at the NFL Combine, and um, my first meeting was with uh, you know Coach Mark Duffner. He's a senior defensive mm-hmm. assistant, and um, he he knows my agent pretty well too. And you know he's been coaching for a long time, and uh, he's a really great coach. And uh, he you know he he texted me and told me to come down to meet him, and we had a really good conversation. And then from that point forward, um, you know throughout the throughout the video. Um, we're like draft process where we, where teams would, would uh, do this and, and zoom and FaceTime mm-hmm. with you. Um, you know, I talked to him several times and then I was able to speak with, with coach golden, Al golden, the uh, linebacker coach um, a couple of times as well. And so I knew that the Bengals were, were uh, very high on me. I knew that was a team that um, if they had the opportunity to draft me, they, they probably would. And um, you know, I, I feel like it's a really good fit. I feel like, uh, there's a there's a lot of opportunity for me. I think I can come in and add instant value on a lot of different um, facets of the of, of the game, and so I'm I'm just very excited. So, Mar- so the one of the coaches that you um you actually did mention, your defensive coordinator Lou Anarumo, he actually used to coach at, at Purdue. I think about 15 years ago. Did you know yeah. about that in the process as well? Did that ever come up? Did did you reach out to some some people at Purdue that to give you advice on Hannah kind of Anarumo or any of their history as well? Um. To be honest, I, I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't know that until I had got drafted, and I saw. I was like, "Oh wow!" Like I, th- I think he used to coach at Purdue, and then of course after you get drafted, all the coaches will call you and, and congratulate you and just get you know talk to you briefly about what the, what the schedule is going to be. And me and him talked a little bit. And he said he coached at Purdue and everything, and so I was you know in my head I'm thinking, okay, maybe he 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 had some more connections there. They were able to get more information on me or anything like that. But yeah, that's really cool. A little, little connection there. Um, that he went to Purdue and he's a defense coordinator. I mean, he was a defense coordinator there and I went to Purdue. So, Talking with newest Bengals linebacker Marcus Bailey here on the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. Happy to have him with us. Speaking of Lou Anarumo, Marcus, whether, what have been kind of some of the early indications as to your potential role on defense? You did, you know, I've watched some of your tape. You've, you were a very exciting player. You've done a lot of different things from a pass rush stand, standpoint active in the backfield you're able to cover well in space play different positions you're also coming in with two other exciting linebackers in the rookie class 
Josh Bynes brought in in free agency. What what's kind of has Lou Anarumo kind of sold you on a vision or or laid out at least an early plan as to where your your role immediately will be on this defense? You know, I'm not I'm not exactly sure yet, and that'll have to um, be better defined as we, as we progress forward and we actually get into practice. Um, but I knew I do know the positions that I'm learning right now. Uh, the Mike and Will inside backer positions. That's you know that's what I was projected to get drafted at, and mm-hmm. um, that's where I played most of my time at Purdue. And so we've just started meetings this past week, and you know it's it's actually been um, been really productive, and we've actually learned a lot in the past few days. It's been pretty intense. So um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what my role is going to be. I, I know I'm going to. Um, probably be and I'm looking forward to being a, a key contributor on special teams you know I, I didn't play a lot of special teams in my last few years or last couple of years at Purdue because I was I was playing most of my time on defense um, but I've, I've had special team experience in the past and um, I, I know I can be valuable on that on that part of the game as well so I'm just excited to be part of the part of the team I know they're trying to you know coach Zach Taylor was talking about uh, you know wanting to change the culture and bringing in the right guys and I think we have a great draft class and I'm very excited to actually get in person with these coaches and and other players and just uh, get this thing rolling you know I think most people who follow the draft know that while you were drafted in the seventh round you probably shouldn't have been there in under normal circumstances as well you like you have a, a much better shot of painting out than most other guys in the seventh round usually do but w- w- were you surprised about where you got drafted did you, did you did you expect that fall that you ended up going or w- what was your f- thought process like as that Saturday kind of dwelled on yeah. Um, so, you know, going into the draft, um, you know, feedback from conversations between GMs, coaches, and my agent, um, coaches to me, um, my general consensus or idea of where I was going to get drafted was probably realistically fourth, fifth round. I thought, I thought that's where I would go. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really anticipate going day two. I thought maybe there would be a chance I was hoping, but, um, you know, I wasn't really getting my hopes up then, but when, but when Saturday, when I woke up Saturday and I was on, I was on Pacific time. So I woke up early. It started mm-hmm. at nine o'clock over there and, you know, started watching it and uh, I'm sitting there waiting. And then I saw my teammate uh, from Purdue, Bryson Hopkins get drafted. I knew he was going to, he was going to get drafted around the same time. So I was like, okay. Like it's probably coming up here soon. I'm just sitting there getting more excited and more excited. The fourth round ends. I'm like, all right, you know, we're good. Fifth round. I'm like, okay, this is the round. And then we keep going we keep going. And then after the fifth round ends, that's when like a little bit of like the the doubt and panic starts to set in. And it goes like from being a, a really exciting and enjoyable day to like, now it's okay. Now I'm, I'm stressed now. I'm stressing the whole time. I'm sitting there. I have like this chair in front of me. I'm grabbing it. I'm really, really literally rocking back and forth, like just waiting to get this call because I'm staring at my phone the whole time. And uh, the first call I got was not the call from the Bengals. It was a call from it was like the middle of the sixth round and it was a North Carolina number. So I was like, Oh, the Panthers, like, okay, let's go. So I, I pick up the phone and it was the, it was, it was one of the coaches from the Kansas city chiefs. Mm. And I'm like, Oh, he's like, Hey Marcus, how are you doing? And you know, my mom's like, she thinks this is the call right here. I'm like, Oh, we're getting, we're going to the chiefs. Like what's going on. And then he was like, this is probably not the call you're looking for. I'm like, wow. Okay. So then he, he they just wanted to be the first one to, kind of kind of get uh, ahead on free agency mm-hmm. so it was like a little bit of like a like a prank call like false hopes i'm like okay I don't, who knows who knows what's gonna happen now so i'm just sitting there like i'm not really sure what's gonna happen and then the same thing happened a miami number called me it was uh, one of the coaches from the dolphins they were pretty much saying the same thing and as that call was going on I, I saw the Bengals were about to start the seventh round and then i get a call from the Bengals when i'm on the phone with the doll uh from Cincinnati when I'm on the phone with the Dolphins and I just hung up because I, I, I just hung up. I was like, yeah, this, this one, the third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. I have to, have to get drafted by the Bengals here. And then sure enough, I pick up the phone and that's, uh, you know, and Mar- and Marcus is Zach Taylor with Cincinnati Bengals. I'm like, okay, now we're in business. I'm, I, we're good now. And it was just a, a moment of, of, of relief, especially in that, in that moment. But in the big picture, obviously that's been my dream since I started playing when I was younger. Um, just a brief moment of validation for all the hard work and sacrifices and um, everything I've, I've done to get to this point. And so I was, you know, I was, I was really excited and overcome with, 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 uh, with emotion in this situation. Uh, but now that's all kind of died down and now I'm settled in. And um, now I'm excited just to, 
just do everything I can to get ready for the season. So, well, your your tape obviously shows that you should have been drafted much, much, much earlier than that. Obviously, some some circumstances outside of your control pro- prohib- prohibited that. But where I w- wanted to go, you know, there's obviously you have a sense of gratitude probably to the team about drafting you and giving you the opportunity, et cetera. But you know, maybe a week or so has gone by now. At what point does that now kind of become fuel for a chip on your shoulder, right? I mean, you, you have to know you're a talented guy. You should have been drafted way earlier than, than you were because of some situations outside of your control. Very talented player. You, you waited till the, the seventh round. I mean, at what point does that kind of fuel you more now? You know, you move away from the gratitude and say, okay, now I, I got a lot to prove. I'm talented. I'm going to be healthy by the time 2020 rolls around and I'm, I'm going to use this to fuel my career. Yeah. So, um, you know, my general thoughts on it or my, my take on it is you can be grateful, but not, not complacent. And that's, that's how I take it. Um, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really celebrate it. I was happy like in the moment and then the hours after the, you know, that day I was I'm obviously really happy, like you said, and, and grateful for the, it's a, cause it's a great opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity, but um, you know, I have confidence in my ability, like you said, and, you know, I'm going to do everything in my power uh, to get myself ready to, you know, contribute as, as much as I can this year. So um, not that I needed an extra chip on my shoulder to be externally motivated, um, anything like that. But, you know, it is frustrating uh, when I feel like, you know, I, I know my ability and, and things like that. So all I can do at this point is just be appreciative for this opportunity and then to make make the most out uh, most out of it at this point. Uh, in in all honesty, I personally don't watch a ton of college football during the season. But one of the games I do remember though was back in 2018. I was at my cousin's house, and they were big Ohio State fans, and they were playing Purdue in 2018. And and Ohio State ended up losing that game. And unfortunately, you weren't you weren't able to play that game because, or I'm sorry, you were you were able to play the game, right? But yeah, so growing up in Columbus, being a diehard Buckeyes fan, who ended up not getting a scholarship from that from that school, how did that feel to be on the field and beat the team that you grew up loving? I mean, yeah, um, you know, going in, well going into the season, I had already had that kind of like highlighted that was going to be a, had to be a good game <laughs> going in. Uh, all you know, all my friends from high school, like I, I went to, you know, I went to Hilliard uh, Hilliard Davidson High School. It's it's a suburb of Columbus, so it's like. A lot of people I know are associated with Ohio State. They went to Ohio State. Um, they're fans, um, my family and friends. So, you know, I knew that was going to be a big game and a big opportunity for me on a big stage to make, you know, make a name for myself. And um, I just remember being so locked in and not letting the not letting the moment get too big for me. Um, you know, not not crumbling under the pressure of it all or anything like that. And I just went out there and played super loose. I was really really well prepared. Um, and this, I was able to fly around and make plays and, you know, it's probably the best game of my career. And a lot of my yes. teammates would probably, probably say the same, uh, for themselves too. I think just as a team, like we were just hitting on all cylinders and, uh, guys were just flying around and we had juice. It was a night game. Um, you know, we had, you know, we had, um, uh, Tyler Trent was, it was a big part of our, our, our organization at that, you know, and he still is to this day. And that was someone that, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, we're playing for that, playing for him. And it was he had he had uh, made the claim that we were going to win the game, and so we had to go out there and you know make it make it true. So there's a lot of things that went into that. Well, I, I, John, I'm surprised you don't remember it because I think Marcus he had like 15 tackles and an interception returned for right. a touchdown in that game. So uh, that was a, that was a hell of a performance by you in that game. But I, talking with Marcus Bailey, new Bengals linebacker, joining us here, he'll be joining us for just a, another minute or so. We thank you for the time, Marcus. Um, I want to ask this because there seems to be a theme from the Zach Taylor regime that started last year, trickled into this year, and that's high character, high football IQ. You are not only a, an academic All-American at, at Purdue, but you are also a team captain. You were very productive on the field. Did that come up in conversations at all in terms of how the Bengals value that and how they respected that out of you in your college background? Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, I, I was a team captain. Um, I know most, I think, if not all the guys that we that we drafted are were team captains, and um, just just after a few a uh, few meetings with 
with the staff and you know coach taylor um you can already kind of get a sense of of what, what we're trying to do here um and so i think that's you know that those are qualities and characteristics that that were highly desired for them and their and their and their search for for prospects and um you know it's yeah, I, I feel i feel very uh honored that they they think i'm someone that meets those qualifications so I'm just excited to be a part of the team. I think I, I fit in well, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see where we get this thing going. Real quick, Marcus, we have a question from the Facebook live chat from oh. Christopher Higdon. He's asked, uh, what player in the AFC North are you most looking forward to hitting? <laughs> well, I, I got a chance to play against uh, Lamar Jackson when I was in mm. Purdue, Purdue versus Louisville. And I, I think he got out – I was uh, – he got out of the pocket on me one time, so I guess I got to get some redemption. So I'm, I'm looking forward to playing against Lamar Jackson. Well, the Bengals need you to play well against him because Lamar Jackson really tore up the Bengals over the past couple of contests. So uh, we need you out there, and we need you to bring that same great play that you had at Purdue. Marcus, this has been an immense pleasure, and I'm, I don't blow smoke in saying this, man. I think big things are ahead of you for the for the for the team and in your career and uh we wish you the best we hope that the recovery uh from the injury is going well and uh you know hopefully this ramp up process with all the craziness going on hopefully you're you're getting up to speed in the playbook and everything but i think big things are ahead of you and we we thank thank you for your time man yeah thank you guys for having me on um always glad to you know try to try to show the fans who i am and interact as, as much as i can so uh Appreciate it. Yeah, well, best of, best of luck ahead, man. Appreciate the time, and uh, hopefully we have you on again soon. Yeah, I am right. Just let me know. All right. Thank awesome. you, Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Marcus Bailey, newest Bengals linebacker for the from, from the 2020 draft class, seventh-round pick. A guy, John, you know, at prepping for this interview, first of all, thanks to Carrick Sports, his agency, for, yes. for lining, lining up that interview. And by the way, we may be – they represent a couple of other Cincinnati Bengals, so we may be getting them on in subsequent weeks. We'll be announcing that as that is confirmed. So thanks to Molly at, at Carrick Sports for um, uh, setting up that interview for us, and thanks to Marcus for his time. But, John, in looking at his tape t today and yesterday, kind of preparing for the interview and, and you know, looking back at some of his things – I, I just, I'm amazed at the, at the fact that the Bengals were able to get this guy in the seventh round. I understand the injuries. I understand it's a concern, but even if, and I don't wish this on him by any means, but even if the knee injuries prohibit him from having maybe a long, long career, if you can get a handful of productive years out of him, which all signs when he's on the field and healthy point to, that is a freaking steal of a draft pick. Absolutely. And I, I'm thinking about how I bungled that question about, cause I got, I didn't remember that he played in that game because honestly, like and you recovered, you did good. Yeah, right. Right. But like, yeah, <laughs> for him being injured like two years and the fact that he played basically what amounted to three full seasons in between, like I, I wanted to ask him about, you know, what does it feel like to be injury prone? But I don't think it's even right for us to even ask that question because is he really that injury prone? I think the NFL looked at his medical and saw two torn ACLs, and the guy's a fifth year senior and think, okay, you know, whatever, sixth, seventh round, you know, we don't, we want to take that risk, but you're right. The risk is absolutely worth it in that juncture. It's, it's, we said it, you know, right after he was drafted or in the recap show, this is very much like the Bengals drafting Rodney Anderson in the late sixth round last year, you know, and his medical injury history was, is a whole nother thing entirely compared to Bailey. But if you have a, a chance to get a guy who's clearly talented enough to be drafted in the first couple of rounds, if he has a clean bill of health, at the weakest position on your roster and you already have two other guys that you drafted that you're, you're more comfortable or you're obviously more comfortable to stay healthy. Like the risk is obviously worth it at that, at that point. And I don't, I, I'm really shocked that there, that he didn't, that um, another team didn't call him about potentially drafting him. It was just the chiefs and the dolphins, I guess, who were willing to sign him as an undrafted free agent. And I'm pretty sure both of those teams had like a, a, at least one more pick in the draft to be able to get him uh, before or after the Bengals pick. So yeah, but, the Bengals got an absolute steal here. And yeah, like you said, even if he doesn't amount to a long-term starter, which would be obviously the best case scenario for a seventh round pick, um, th they still have an opportunity to get a great player here. There, the Bengals have had some luck with seventh round picks in the past in somewhat recent history. Uh, TJ Hushman Zada obviously being the biggest case. And remember Jonathan Finane? He was another guy who was a seventh round pick. You know, Hushman Zada was supposedly too slow 
couldn't separate. He had a pretty dang good career for himself. Finane lasted in the league for a long, long time, ended his career with the Patriots and was a nice rotational player for the Cincinnati Bengals. Obviously, seventh round picks being heavy contributors are is a little bit of an outlier, but I really think, and I went, you know, I wasn't just saying that because he was here. I really think that if this kid stays healthy, he has a bright future with this team, especially at, in a position group that needs it. The good news, John, I mentioned they signed Josh Bynes. Bynes is probably set for the year to be their interior guy, maybe along with Logan Wilson as well, rotating around in there. But he mentioned that he wants, you know, he's looking at playing the Mike backer for the Cincinnati Bengals. The good news is the Bengals can ease him into that role this year if they need to, if there is a, a potential setback with the knee, or if they want to potentially avoid a Rodney Anderson type of situation, you know, where you can kind of ease him into the lineup and, and let him learn for a year, let him play a little bit. Um, you know, I, I just think he has the ability to impact football games. If you see, if you look at his stats when he's healthy, John, he really has some high impact plays. Yeah. And, you know, you, you look at Jermaine Pratt last year. He was a senior who played the senior bowl, but he only had 13 starts at linebacker. He was a converted safety at that position. You know, Marcus Bailey has, I think, 40 career starts at linebacker in, in his collegiate career. He's experienced and he can be willing to go in there immediately and be at the very least an average contributor whereas jermaine pratt took a long time to really fill into that role and didn't really start um you know being a productive player at the position until later on the year if you've put marcus bailey in there if you have to i think you're not gonna have a liability at linebacker but obviously that because they address the position with logan wilson keem davis gather they're gonna have pratt they're starting and obviously like you said josh Bynes is projected to start they don't need to do that they don't need to have him play starting snaps if they absolutely have to and, and you have to turn to bailey i think they would still be in decent shape because all the things that you like about logan wilson the, the ability to stack and shed the ability to play in space to be an athlete and have eyes for the ball everything about that applies to bailey and bailey is a little bit younger and he might even be a, a slightly better athlete and he was a little bit more productive at a, at a school that played a, a stronger strength of schedule so if you compare both prospects i think you, you might even end up with bailey being the better guy just on film and on tape and from an athleticism standpoint obviously the interest is why he's here, but again, like look at Clayton Fedulum, Odd and Tate, both those guys didn't end up yeah. being long term starters. I see Chinadum and Duque was another yeah. that some few, yeah. Yeah, and Duque was one of my personal favorites growing up too. So it, like again, if it's not a long term starter, it's whatever. But I think if, if he turns out like Fedge or Odd and Tate is turning out to be, it's it's by far a successful pick. Well, it was fun talking with him. Seems like a really nice young young man. And I say young man, he's barely barely younger than you as you so <laughs> greatly pointed out making me feel so old I but, take what I can get. <laughs> uh, but no seems like a really great guy and uh, hopefully we can have him on again down the road and and he can talk about you know how successful he's become since being a seventh round pick but uh, very very great young man by by all indications we wish him the best and hopefully good things are are going to come his way and hopefully we're the good luck charm for that so thank you to marcus bailey for for joining us thank you to molly at carrick sports for arranging the interview as i said we'll have some announcements at the end of the show when we drop the mic but um we may be that uh, they represent some other Bengals players that we may also be getting on the program so we'll be sure to keep you up to date on that more on this uh, coming up on this episode here in just a second, we're going to talk about some news surrounding some offensive skill position players with the Cincinnati Bengals, and then John is going to kick off our nine for nine series, a positional preview series. And apropos to the interview you just heard, we're going to start with linebacker. So we'll talk about that towards the end of the program. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. You can get this show and the other shows on the Cincy Jungle podcast channel on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, Megaphone, uh, iHeartRadio, however you may listen to your podcast. We also have all of our stuff on our YouTube channel. You may be joining us there live and or uh, the Cincy Jungle Facebook page. And then all, the all of our stuff is on cincyjungle.com. By the way, there's also on cincyjungle.com a really nice breakdown by Matt Minnick, also part of our podcast crew, on uh, Marcus Bailey and coverage. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to read uh, that and see some film clips on that, go ahead and check that out. Really, uh, really good stuff. But again, thanks to Marcus Bailey for that interview. 
John, let's talk about some news. I don't want to belabor one point too much because we did a kind of a breaking news episode on it. And, uh, you know, I, I, it is what it is. But Andy Dalton released somewhat predictably and not so predictable for some people. I mentioned it as a possibility in the show, but I didn't think it would be overly viable. But he goes to Dallas. How do you, what do you make of how that whole thing played out from the Bengals releasing him and not able to net anything for, for him in a trade and the fact that he went to Dallas on the deal that he did? The whole situation with how the Bengals handled it, I think that that's, that's, that's known. It's like, there's no need to overanalyze it. They hold, they held on to him for as long as they could because they wanted to find a trade. They thought a trade would be the best way to maximize, obviously the compensation they would get for letting him go and giving him a chance to go somewhere that he wanted to go to potentially start. Once those op- options were exhausted, they couldn't find a trade partner. It, I think it just became about what was best for Andy, and that's why he asked for his release, and that's why he was ultimately granted his release. We didn't think about Dallas because we were still in this mindset. We were thinking, okay, where is a place he can go that he can play in 2020? If he still has the mentality of thinking, I can start, or I can you know, I can, I can compete for a starting job against a young guy, <clears throat> Dallas obviously doesn't enter that equation. They have a guy, Dak Prescott, who, by all means, should be one of the highest paid quarterbacks at this point by now. I don't know what the, I don't know why Jerry Jones is fumbling that back. Um, but I think it became clear over the past couple of days that Dalton chose Dallas because he lives there. And while all this unknown stuff with with the pandemic is happening, it's just the best place for him to find some stability, still being the NFL, but also not go too far away from his home, stay, be able to stay at home with his family. And in a place where he can just be a high-end backup. Obviously, he's one of the best backup quarterbacks in the, in the NFL right now. Obviously, one of the more valuable backup quarterbacks from a salary standpoint. Um, it, we can talk about you know how what could happen if Dak holds out and how he fits in that offense, whatever. But I honestly don't think that that was part of the equation at that point. It was just a matter of this is what's best for me right now. And ultimately, if everything goes well in 2020, I have my eyes set for 2021. My, I, I become a free agent and I have all my options at the beginning of the free agent market when that opens in, in early or mid-March instead of being on the market in, in late April. So I think that's ultimately his plan. I don't think he has any intention of playing this year. I think he's assuming that Prescott is going to play and he's going to be paid. Or even if he isn't going to be paid, he's going to sign that franchise tag and be the starter. So I don't think he has any aspirations of competing with Dak or being this leverage piece against Dak. I think it's just about, I can be here now while everything is going on in the world. And then 2020 is my goal. 2021 is my goal. Yeah. Neil Townsend in the live YouTube chat is echoing something that I put on Twitter that actually got, I didn't realize it would have got the traction it got, but it got quite a bit of (laughs) views, I guess. But I basically, I, I just find it hilarious that Dalton was this whipping boy, especially for the last two, three years by the national media, by the local media, And now he goes to Dallas and it's the perfect situation. And if he was to start, he can win nine or 10 games and great move by Dallas, picking him up on a one-year deal. And could he, is there a quarterback controversy in Dallas because he's so much cheaper than Dak would be all the, all that sort of thing. Now I, I understand it's a little bit of a slow time in the sports world because of the pandemic and talking points need to be (laughs) created, but I was just kind of blown away that we're sitting here saying, well, not we, you and I, but others on ESPN and other large platforms saying, you know, this, this is a great move. This is a guy who could get you to the playoffs if you need him to. I don't necessarily disagree with that. It just was to me a big 180 from some recent opinions about Andy Dalton as a starting quarterback. I think it's because he just went to, the 2020 version of the 2015 Bengals and yeah, maybe. in yeah. the 2015 Bengals, like that's, that was obviously his best year. He's going to a place with now three high quality receiving options, a great offense line with a big question mark at center because Travis Frederick died and a solid running game. Like that, that's literally the environment for him to succeed. And I think people just base that off the projections that they're now saying. Now, I don't think that the perception of Dalton, the quarterback has changed. He's always been a situational dependent player at the position and now he's in a, a fantastic situation. So that's, I guess, where the questions came up. And obviously, you know, it's the Cowboys, and they severely underrate whatever. Whenever they get a, 
they severely underrate their quarterbacks whenever they get a good one. Tony Romo was treated like absolute crap for the times that he was really good. No one ever really thought that he was the answer. In and he was good most of the time. That's that's what I'm saying. Like when Tony yeah. Romo brought up as a comparison for Joe Burrow, I, which I think is the most apt comparison, I think that would be fantastic if he ended up like right. Tony Romo, but he was villainized in Dallas. And I don't understand that at all. And I guess the, the same thing is happening with Dak Prescott. He's clearly at this point a top 10 quarterback, and the Cowboys have space to pay him. I don't know why they aren't. And then it became a question of, would you rather pay Dak you know, 35, 40 million or just start and eat Bellin for you know a couple million. It just it, it it doesn't work like that at the quarterback position. It, do, it doesn't matter if you're saving thirty million dollars a year by starting Andy Dalton. If you have the option to play the better quarterback, you play the better quarterback ten times out of ten. That's the thing that no, most people aren't getting. But I guess we have to talk about it because we can't talk about anything else at this point. <laughs> uh, fatal content. Good good buddy from a long time ago in the YouTube chat. Good to, good to see you, Fatal. Uh, the opinion is based on the Bengals versus Cowboys and the bad perception um, that they're better, but the Bengals have been more successful lately. Yeah, yes and no. Yeah, in terms of the successful lately, um, you know, if you want to, if you're including 2011 through 2015, yes, then that that would be accurate. The thing I find funny and kind of to Fatal's point there is, and to what you said, you know, he's falling into a potential Bengals 2015 type of situation. It, it's it's not really like the Bengals. And it sounds weird to say because they're two and fourteen, and maybe we're just on this high based on what happened this offseason, but it's not exactly like the Bengals offensive skill position talent cupboard is bare. They I mean, it it has been bare because of injuries, and right. it has been bare because of the offensive line, its woeful play over the past couple of seasons. But I mean, really, if you if Dalton was to stay. In Cincinnati, you're looking at potentially AJ Green coming back healthy, Joe Mixon, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. I, I, I mean, you lose Tyler Eifert, one of his favorite targets, but I mean, there's a lot there. And then you look over at Dallas, Zeke, uh, Gallup, Amari, C.D. Lamb. I mean, it, it, I, I think you would say Dallas because of the injury factor probably has the upper hand there, but it's not like there's just absolutely nothing in Cincinnati, that's where I'm kind of like, it's just, it's funny to me how this has been spun. And then when you go through all that, I think you would unequivocally take Dallas's offensive line over the Bengals offensive line. And there, there have been some seasons and cases where Donald has been able to work with at least average receivers. When you, when you put them up, you know, with a, with a pass protection set of just giant question marks and guys who could beat like Bobby Hart, then, then that, obviously becomes a different evaluation. Tyron Smith, Lyle Collins, even Connor Williams to an extent, like they, they have solid, you know, stable pieces there, even with Zach Martin, I didn't even mention him. They have franchise level pieces there that can protect him if he needs to. And that's obviously, that's ultimately what boosts him up to be able to, uh, you know, take advantage of the weapons that the Bengals accumulated. And if the Bengals had stayed healthy, I don't think, I obviously don't think Dalton wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been that bad or as bad as he was last year, you know, 2018 wasn't so long ago and they had AJ Green for most of that season. And he ended up being at least an average level quarterback. So again, it, it's all based on situations. It's all based on the environment that he's around. And like you said, the, the Cowboys don't have the stigma of their, their stars getting injured at, at the worst possible moment. And I think I, that just wasn't part of the equation or the conversation when talking about Dalton's show with the Cowboys, they don't assume that the Cowboys offensive weapons and offensive line are going to, deplete due to health like i think some stricken Bengals fans think at this point so I, it's just a variable that i think still needed to be accounted for in those uh, discussions well we're gonna move on and talk about another player in just a second here i mean i guess i'll just kind of say this you know i kind of got banged on a little bit by some of our our listeners and viewers on the youtube channel because i came off i guess a little somber in terms of the Bengals releasing andy dalton and and whatnot i mean today it's an end of an era but that doesn't mean that we can't be both simultaneously a little bit of uh i don't know just i don't know if grief is the right word but just kind of reflective of the time that Andy Dalton was here, but also be very excited about the Joe Burrow era and what's ahead for the Cincinnati Bengals. And I think that's where we should be as a fan base kind of, Hey, thanks Andy. Appreciate what you did. You really, in the, in the grand scheme of things, Andy Dalton really kind of rose above many initial expectations that were set out for him and this team to be one of the franchise leaders in every major statistical category, whether you want to attribute that to surrounding talent or whatever you want to do. 
the fact that he was a second round pick, the team was picked to be terrible and he was maybe not going to be in a starting position for a, for very long. I mean, he outlived the expectations. So got to be thankful for that and all the wins that came with him, but it has been overdue time to move on from Andy Dalton. The Bengals have done so. And now the Joe Burrow era is officially, officially underway. There's no sense of Dalton starting. If anybody had that kind of weird thought, Burrow's the guy, Dalton's gone, and that era is underway. The other move that the Bengals, I guess, didn't make, John, was not to exercise the fifth-year option on John Ross. This also was kind of a, I guess, a little bit of a surprise to some, but for the most part, I think it was expected. Uh but I, I think it, it has to be the right move for the, by the Bengals because of the injuries, because of some of the inconsistencies in play that weren't on film when he was at Washington. The drops and all that kind of stuff, these lapses in concentration, that wasn't really on film when the Bengals picked him at number nine overall. It, it, some of that stuff, along with the injuries, have just plagued his career. So the Bengals kind of said it's not really worth the the risk at this point. I want to get your thoughts on that, but I also want to get your thoughts on the, on if you think that that means any kind of negotiation is off the table. If Ross ends up playing pretty well after this year, is that just a bit, basically we're, we're cutting ties now, regardless of what happens in 2020. That seems to be what, the, the guys who have ears in the organization believe it's the case. Like Ross is going to be entering a contract year and he's basically playing for his next contract. I think it would be smart if they would at least entertain the idea of maybe like a modest two year extension to go along with, with this last year of his contract. Very similar to, I think what they did with Giovanni Bernard last year. So they gave him a two year extension to go on to the last year of his, which was Bernard's second contract, but just, just to tag on to Ross, Ross's rookie contract. I think that would be smart because, honestly, if you play out most of the scenarios here of how this can go, most of them end with John Ross leaving the Bengals after this year. If, if he plays really well and stays healthy, he, he probably plays himself out of the Bengals' price range because they know who Ross is at this point. He's played three years in the NFL. He's only started 24 games. He hasn't been able to stay healthy for you know, a consistent season. It's basically a similar situation with Tyler Eifert where they're just not going to be comfortable giving him any type of a long-term extension because they don't trust him to stay healthy. The only way he would come back is if he was on some type of a one-year deal like Eifer was. And the only way that happens is if he, he you know, has a similar year to last year where he played half the year and he played well enough to warrant coming back, or if he stinks and the Bengals may not want to bring him back at all, or if he just gets injured for most of the year. And again, the Bengals just don't want to deal with it anymore. So the only way that he comes back is if he kind of has a similar year to last year. And I don't think that's what we want. I think we all want John Ross to succeed because if John Ross succeeds, the offense in, as a whole would succeed more. Joe Burrow would have a better year than, than if he's on the sideline. At this point, I think it's in the Bengals' best interest, in my opinion, to just give him that you know one or two year extension to go along on top of this year, so you don't lose him free agency. So you you are you are able to give him at least two years of Joe Burrow to see if something works out, and you're able to afford him because his value is obviously really low. But I just don't think that's in the cards at this point. I think the Bengals want to see him you know, light it up in a contract year and play as it and play so well that he gets a contract for another team that nets them a, a compensatory pick in 2022. That just seems to be like the most yeah. likely scenario because there's no way they were going to pay him $16 million next year for the type of career that he's had up to this point. And, and the other thing is he may have a boost in stats, both because he's health, maybe he finally stays healthy this year and also the Joe Burrow effect where he spreads the ball. They let, they'll probably going to spread the formation out quite a bit, have a, multiple receivers. Maybe he is more effective in more single coverage type of situations, especially with A.J. Green on the field and he on the field at the same time, Tyler Boyd out there, where, where you got to kind of pick your poison if all of those guys are healthy and effective. My, you know, to your point, John, about a $16 million price tag in 21 if they were to give him the fifth year option or a franchise tag or you know what, whatever that may look like it, it right now you could argue that john ross is your number four option at wide receiver your number five option at wide receiver depending on how the team looks at out and tate so 
not only just from a you can't stay healthy and you're inconsistent type of standpoint, it's almost like paying a guy that's way down the pecking order of your depth chart, and that just doesn't really make sense, especially when you spent so much on really integral pieces in free agency this last year. It, it, it's been known for some time that Marvin Lewis – wasn't the biggest Tron Ross fan coming yeah. out of the draft. I There's think a lot of talk about that. Yeah. If his name was Ruben Foster, I don't think he would have been benched the way that he was his rookie year, unfortunately. And obviously the injuries didn't help because that, I mean, like you said, he was so talented at Washington. He ended up producing in his final year like a Pro Bowl player. So the, the, the on tape and on paper, he was picked right around where he should have been. I, there mm-hmm. was a lot of talk about him being a one-trick pony. That just wasn't true if you watched Washington. There wasn't. He, he, you don't get 17 touchdowns most of them being in the red zone by just being a guy who just runs nine routes. He was so good at creating separation at the line of scrimmage, and that speed was a weapon. Sometimes guys with high potentials, they don't they don't turn out. It could be with health. It could be with confidence issues. It could be with just not meshing well with, with where you end up, and that's basically applies in all three phases with John Ross. He, like he, The coaching staff wasn't completely on board with him from, from the beginning. He didn't mesh well with his quarterback. They, they just didn't maximize his ability in, in that offense, and when they tried to, he just got injured. And that was unfortunately a concern with him coming out of college because he did suffer a couple injuries at Washington. So it was a risk that ultimately didn't pay off under that regime. And this is, and again, the, the timing couldn't be worse because unfortunately under, you know, under these uh, restrictions or just the guidelines of the CBA, you have to exercise that fifth year option after your third year. And that's, that's the timeline. You can't you know, work around that. So unfortunately with Ross, his first three years have now warranted that. So this is unfortunately the, the path that they're going to because they don't really have another choice. Injuries, potentially in his own head, like you mentioned, the lack of confidence, uh, maybe spawning from Marvin Lewis in those early days, and maybe even improper usage of him in a system, getting him the ball in ways that are more conducive to his strengths. I think are all contributing factors to what we've seen to a, a disappointing career to this point for John Ross. What would you say is the biggest? If you had to, if you had to, the biggest is the No, the biggest, the biggest contributing factor oh. of, of why we're seeing Ross's career path going the way that it is. It has to be injuries. I think is, yeah. is, the, is the big one. Like obviously the, the the mesh with Lewis and I guess the offense coordinators that he had worked with, it just wasn't there. And uh, you know, we all thought that Andy Dalton could benefit from a guy who could take the top off of a defense, but unfortunately, he just there was never able. He was never able to develop some type of chemistry with him. But that also comes with injuries. He just couldn't stay on the field and couldn't develop that, and and just couldn't develop you know his potential in the time that he needed to to take advantage of that fifth year option and to potentially get an extension this year. So if you can't stay on the field then everything else is, is moot. So it, while all those factors mattered, the health was the most important one. Yeah. I'm interested very, uh, I'm highly, highly interested to see how he's used in this final year of his deal. Uh, Ken Dippel, a good friend of the show mentions kick off running back kickoffs. I don't think that'll be in his repertoire, but he did that in college and he was effective at it. I always kind of thought if you're not going to use them on offense, especially in the early times of Marvin Lewis, maybe use them on special teams. Um, if you do the bubble screens and other yards after the catch type of opportunities to take advantage of that, of that speed, I'd really like to see them do that. But um, like I said, he might be a little bit low on the pecking order, but as it is, the Bengals move on from Andy Dalton. He is now with the Dallas Cowboys on a one-year deal that can be worth up to 7 million base salary, I believe is 3 million. And the Bengals did not, exercise the fifth year option on John Ross. Both were a bit expected, but both kind of came out of the news wire this week and were kind of major news and notes we wanted to get to this week. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. John's going to kick off our nine for nine series in just a minute. As I've mentioned before, you can get this show wherever you download your audio podcasts. And you can get it on YouTube and CincyJungle.com. We appreciate all of the support you've shown this program, especially over the past handful of months as excitement has built around the franchise and what the team has done. It's good to see some new faces, good to see some of the old faces from a long time ago in the live chat. Try and join us, if you can, live when we record. Subscribe to the channels, get notified when we go live, as well as when new material is available. So, like Anthony mentioned, um, it's it's even dur- 
during a pandemic, this is the downtime of football season. Um, usually we would have some some news and notes to report from OTAs, but we don't have um, access to obviously to Zoom conference calls dur- during that time. So <laughs> um, I, I, we're just going to go through in these next two months, I guess it's going to take us through July. Uh, every position group of the Bengals roster right now, they're technically at 84 players on their 90 man roster. They have a few openings, but the majority of these position groups are solidified. Uh, most of the faces on the roster now are going to be competing in training camp, whenever that may happen. And um, I basically went through each position and randomized the order of which we would talk about them. And as it happens, uh, linebacker ended up being the first one. And like Anthony mentioned, it was perfect timing because we just talked about, we just talked with one of the linebackers, Marcus Bailey. But I think we want to start with who are the guys that we expect to take significant snaps this year. Basically, it's also you know who's going to start, but it's more than who's going to start. It's who's going to be maybe utilize more in sub packages, who's going to contribute in special teams as well. Who are the big faces that are going to be making part of, of this position group? So Anthony, who do you project um, is going to start in this defense? And also if they don't start, who's going to make a, a big impact as that rotational guy in certain situations? So, I, I mean, I think Bynes is that veteran guy that they're going to use often. And he's familiar with the AFC North. So I, I, I just think there's a lot of things about him that make sense as a stopgap option. I mean, I use that uh, sometimes that comes off as a negative, but it's not just a, a stopgap option. I, I mean, he's going to provide quite a bit of value, I think, and a lot of steady play. Uh, is he an outstanding linebacker? No, but I think he's got, he brings a lot of skills. And I think that you're going to see, you're going to see a, a, a subtle, difference right away uh, in terms of the level of play, just because of him being there and Preston Brown being out. I I, I think there's just a a lot of value there. I think, I think Logan, you're going to see a lot of Logan Wilson um, mixed in there. Uh, And, and if, you know, I do think Marcus Bailey will have, uh, will be in there a, a little bit. I think the injury may cause the Bengals to pull the reins back a little bit initially. Um, but I, I think, you know, as time wears on, he, he is healthy, et cetera. I think you'll see a higher pro- profile role for him. I, I think you're going to see a niche kind of edge type of role from Akeem Davis Gaither. He was one of the best pass, pass rushing linebackers. That's not a, you know, a, a true, you know, TJ Watt type of player that is, you know, an edge rusher. He, he is an outside linebacker, but he was one of the more effective guys off the edge rushing the passer. So, you know, I, I think on one hand, Logan Wilson has the ability to be that be all linebacker, do everything pretty well. I don't think he's there yet because of the leap to the NFL that he has to take, but I think he has the ability to kind of do you know, stop the run, diagnose plays, play in space. I think he can do all of that. I don't think he's there yet. But if you're, I think what what the brilliance is in the Bengals bringing in these three linebackers in the draft is that they all do something a little different. Um, you can kind of make the argument that maybe Marcus Bailey and Logan Wilson are a little bit more closely aligned in terms of their skill sets, but. You can rotate these guys around. You can bring Davis Gaither off the edge as an additional pass rush option and or send him off into the flat. And, and may, you know, there you can kind of rotate and move guys around. So I don't think any of these guys right now are three down linebackers. Few of them are even two down linebackers. But I think if you can get an effective one down, maybe two downs out of a lot of these guys and move them around, keep the other offense guessing. I think that's what the Bengals want to do with their linebacker group and have not been able to do for a long time. It's interesting because um, Chalk Talks Matt Minich actually went through the Bengals' entire 2019 defensive film, and he recorded um, basically how many times the Bengals were in specific personnel groupings. And what he came up with was that 55% 55% of the time, the Bengals were in your traditional you know, nickel set with two linebackers and four down linemen. Um, 23% of the time, they were in your 5-2 uh, looks with five down linemen and two off-ball linebackers, which is really just 3-4, and you're treating the edges as down linemen, I guess, because it, it, it was just a transition year, and you still identified Carl Lawson and Sam Hubbard as defensive ends and not linebackers. Regardless, though, 
that's over 75% of the time you have two linebackers on the field. So even though you're in nickel technically for just a little bit over half of that, you still only have two traditional linebackers on the field. So th- they don't run a 4-3 anymore. They only basically ran that to counter uh, Lamar right. Jackson's offense, at least, I think mainly just in one week. So you're only going to have two linebackers on the field for the vast majority of the time. But it- it's interesting which two linebackers those are going to be based off those personnel groupings. Because if you're in a 5-2, if you're in a 3-4, I think that's where you'll see Josh Bynes and Jermaine Pratt as your more experienced, you know, run fit diagnosing type players who can stack and shed and be able to do multiple things. If you're in your nickel set when you're expecting to play the pass, I think that becomes a situation where you take one of those guys out of off the field and insert Logan Wilson in there. If you're more comfortable with him in space compared to a guy like Pratt or maybe even Bynes, who is by far the, the grandpa of this group. He's the only person above like age 25 in this entire position group. <laughs> And he's, you know, he's got 10 years in the league. So if you're, if you don't think that he can replicate what he did last year against the pass when he's one of the best linebackers in coverage, then maybe you take him off the field and put him and put Logan Wilson next to Jermaine Pratt when you're in nickel. But when you're in that base set, maybe that's when you, you have Bynes take most of the snaps because Bynes is like, he doesn't have any guaranteed money attached to his contract. So I have a hard time thinking he's a roster lock, even though I think they would absolutely love to have him on the team and have him make the, have him make the team. I think that was the plan, but if you know all three linebackers that they drafted stay healthy and look good, if not better than Bynes, it becomes a question of is Bynes as safe as, as we may think he is. I think they want him on the field, but if they come to a situation where they have three guys that are definitely better than him and they want one of those guys to start, I think it becomes an interesting question with Bynes. I, I feel a little stupid because I was so excited to talk about the new additions, the four new additions to the position group that I didn't think about really chatting about the addition that the team made to the group last year in Pratt. And if you notice when he started playing more, got more time later in the year, took over a bit for Preston Brown in that, in that position group, different player, but you get my point. The defense started playing better. The competition level towards the end of the year was definitely not as high as it was towards, you know, the beginning middle of the year with your San Francisco's and your Baltimore's and that sort of thing. But the defense played much improved football down the stretch with some changes that they made and letting some of these guys grow and play. And Pratt is one of them. Do I think that Pratt's ever going to be a pro bowl player or, you know, a star in the league? No, not really. But I think he could be a very solid player in that group. Another one of those guys that he was a converted safety. A lot of people forget he, he played safety early on at NC State and then became a linebacker. So he's got the athleticism. He's got some range. He's another one of those guys that can maybe do it all. I'm curious. You brought this up, and some other people are talking about it in the chat, the Lamar Jackson defense. That's what I'm really curious about because that is a that is a, an offense that has torched the Bengals, made the linebackers look silly, the Nick Vigil film with, with the spin by Jackson and, and out of the time. I mean, we, we've seen that over and over and over again. I, I'm curious to see what the Bengals do from a positional group standpoint at linebacker in the Lamar Jackson defense. And I think you're going to see a bit more of those do it all type of guys on the field. Often Wilson Pratt potentially binds. Um, so you have that, those guys out there that, yeah, you're comfortable, you're more comfortable with them playing in space, but also, uh, you know, they, they, they are more sound tacklers and can potentially wrangle Lamar Jackson when he uses his legs. So, you know, I, I, I think those are the three that'll probably have the, the highest volume of snaps, not only because of their skill sets, but also the injuries to Bailey and Davis Gaither, those, those kind of concerns that are coming with those guys. But, um, I, I see a lot of movement in this group and a lot of a lot of rotating. And, and I think that topic goes well with uh, what Ken Dipple said in the comment section. He's talking about you know why are they not playing more man to man coverage? Why are we sticking with these soft lazy zones as he called it? The reality is, if you try to go man to man, you know, 100 percent time of the game, you're going to get gassed and you're going to get burned, especially when you're facing the offensive like the Chiefs where they just torch you horizontally and you just are not going to be able to keep up with it. You're not going to be able to keep up with the athletes at the receiving positions in the NFL. That's why most defenses, they go zone most of the time. And unfortunately, the Bengals just didn't have the athletes to even do zone. That's how bad it was. That's why they looked at this offseason as a chance to basically revolutionize that. And when you're talking about facing Lamar Jackson, they, they had three linebackers on the field, but they also have one of the safeties up close. They've had 
what's well, called the middle of the field close de- type defense because the Ravens mm-hmm. love using you know Mark Andrews and some of those slot receivers to go up the seams up the middle and they want to have the, and the Bengals ideally would like to have Jesse Bates back there to just basically close the, the field between between the hash marks to avoid those types of vertical routes and also while you have Bates you know in, in the free safety spot I think the addition of Von Bell becomes interesting here because while yeah. Von Bell is listed as a safety he does but his best work essentially as a linebacker which is what a lot of people think Sean Williams is good at but unfortunately he's not at this point in his career Von Bell like we said when they signed him does exactly what the Bengals coaches wanted Sean Williams to do last year. And if he becomes an integral part with a, basically a positionless linebacker, basically an overhang defender who can also run and chase in that Baltimore Ravens offense, I think his addition becomes an interesting variable in, in, in that type of scheme. Because again, you want to have the middle of the field closed when you play Lamar Jackson. Those are his favorite throws to make down the field. But then you have Von Bell creeping up there as basically acting as a third or fourth linebacker. And he can also r- rush down to the edge and make some solid tackles. The other issue, too, uh, just going back to the zone conversation, the zone man-to-man conversation from a secondary standpoint, the Bengals also, not only just because you get gassed from a defensive standpoint, the Bengals didn't have Dar- Darquez Denard uh, at the beginning of the year, pup list, right? Uh, Drake Kirkpatrick later in the year, a, a man-to-man kind of corner, a, a-, a physical corner was on IR towards the end of the year. Darius Phillips, a very athletic, fast corner, was on IR return for a spell. So if the Bengals wanted to run more man-to-man coverage, by the way, Darquez Denard also excels at that mm-hmm. in, the, in the slot. He's a very physical guy. They were kind of unable to do it because of the injuries that hit that position group last year. So uh, you know, I, I think that plays into it. I love that you brought up Bell, though, John, because that is a that seems to be a little bit of a, a thing that NFL defenses are doing in ter- is finding these hybrid guys, these guys that do you know that you can move them around a little bit. Yeah, they're a safety by name, but you play them in the box, and they kind of they play in a more compact area of space and. You know, they can get the occasional turnover, but really it's tackling, it's limiting damage, limiting yardage, and potentially making plays in those short yardage red zone type of areas to limit damage. So that I think Von Bell, while a safety, he could be kind of considered a little bit of a linebacker addition. I think that's extremely fair. And I think his addition ultimately could impact how many they ended up keeping, which is kind of where I wanted to take this to the next point. Last year, they only had four linebackers on the opening week roster. And that's not only because the strength of the team was obviously not a linebacker, but also, you know, it's just kind of the way that the league was going at that point where they were in- implementing the defense where they only had two linebackers on the field for most of the time. And we could probably see that happen again this year. So I think right now you could say that they have five rosterable guys. But if you just had to make the guess right now about which guys end up making the roster, Who are your guys? And if you have one guy that can make a surprise leap in training camp that we're not really talking about, who is that guy? Well, it's interesting because I wonder how with, with the practice situation and, and we're seeing questions. I saw someone ask us, do you, do we think the season's going to start, et cetera, because of the COVID situation. And um, you know, that's another topic that could take up an entire show, but uh, look, I mean, what I'm getting at here, John, is what what about the pup situation? Is Marcus mm-hmm. Bailey a pup guy because of the the, the knee injury? Even that he's healthy. I've I, he said it to us, and he said it on other appearances that you know he's been working out, he's been fully cleared, etc. But that doesn't necessarily mean the Bengals will rush him into something right away. And if they like, you know, if they've got Wilson, Davis, Gaither, Bynes, Pratt. And then you've got a scrum with Bailey and Evans and, you know, a handful of other guys, you know, do the Bengals kind of get creative and say, well, maybe we could use the pup list on a guy like Bailey, let him heal up for the first six weeks, have a guy that's healthy and ready to go right then. And then we activate him later on. Um, But I, I think that's a possibility. But if you're asking me right now, I mean, the Bengals invested in four linebackers this offseason for a reason. And those four guys, I think, are going to make the roster. 
and be moved around and, and play right away, including the young man that joined us earlier, Marcus Bailey. I think he, you know, I said the pup list could be a possibility. I, I think if he shows that he's ready to, ready to go and healthy, I, I think that he makes the team. And I think that all of these Marvin holdover guys, the, the Nickersons, the Evans and all those guys, you know, I, I think it it might be time that they that they move away from him. I, I think you had kind of said well, who's kind of a wild card. I think Evans is a wild card. He looks the part in terms of size and some of the college tape, but it has not translated overly well to the pros so far. Uh, it, it's going to be at least five. I don't think they're going to go to four like you like you mentioned. They've just invested too much to end up right. going that low of a, of a number. And if they go six. Well, the five being obviously Pratt, Bynes, and then the three guys. Right. I think the timeline. That's what I was saying, yeah. Yeah, I think the timeline for Bailey fits a lot with Rodney Anderson. Unfortunately, with Anderson, he just ended up re-injuring it. The, obviously, the hope for Bailey is that that doesn't happen again. But I think they have the expectation that Bailey is going to be ready to go whenever preseason or training camp heats up. And he's obviously talented enough to make the final roster. So I think it's fair to have the assumption that he's going to be healthy enough to make the final roster. And then if he does, like there's there's your five right there. If they go six, it, I, I think it's a three way battle between Evans, like you mentioned, Austin Calitro, who they just claimed off of waivers, who they tried to claim last year, if you remember when they were at the, when they were yeah, they the, another guy, yeah, right. They yeah. weren't at the top of the waiver order last year, and they put a claim in for him. And I think the Jaguars ended up getting him. Um, and then it's those two guys. And then the undrafted guy, Marcel Spears Jr., who apparently is getting buzz, according to Jeff Hobson of Bengals.com. He might be a guy to watch out for. He played at Iowa State last year. He's only six foot, 221 pounds, but that's, I mean, that's basically how big Akeem Davis Gaither is as well. So they don't mind that lack of size compared to how they did in the past. If they go six, it's probably one of those three. And I think at this point, you have to give it to Evans because he's just one of the most experienced special teams guys on this roster. And unfortunately, they had some of those guys in Darren Simmons' unit uh, depart this offseason. I think he wants to keep as much uh, experience in that uh, unit as possible. But it's it's completely, I mean, it's not like Evans has a, has a spot locked. If they go six, I think he's the favorite to take that six spot, but they could easily go five. And I think it could be also the right decision. Yeah, Austin Calitro, we, we didn't really talk about him. That is a guy that the Bengals have shown an immense amount of love for, claiming, you know, trying to claim him off waivers twice in, in consecutive years and finally succeeding this year. A guy that they seem to like a lot and, and uh, they feel can bring value. I think he could, you know, he could be one of those special team slash rotational guys on defense. They seem to really, really like what he brings to the table, too. So, you know, I, I said four off-season edition. It's actually five if you include Calitro. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think that they are – there is a reason that they made those five acquisitions. Um, and I think you're going to see those I, – I, 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 it's possible that they keep six. And uh, of the six, five of them are the new, the new guys, and the other guy is Jermaine Pratt. I think that's very, very feasible. The other thing, you know – that plays into this does does that Von Bell hybrid thing does that kind of kill two roster spots with one stone there and then you can go heavier on offensive line at cornerback when they make this final roster is that what they look at um in, in terms of Bell's Bell status I just I find it hard to believe going back to Calitro I find it hard to believe that you would want to claim a guy off waivers two consecutive years and cut him I just I feel like there there's something there that the Bengals really really like and they want to hang on to. That it makes a lot of sense. Uh, ultimately, once the pads go on and you know he has to prove it out there, that it's that's what's going to come down to. If Evans is, is still the better player than him, then it's, the decision is easy. But yeah, I think you have a point there. Where as they've tried to claim him twice now, they've they they finally been able to do that and he might have the advantage because this is a new staff that wants him. And Evans is still one of the few defenders on this roster that was drafted by the Marvin Lewis staff. So that's a good point there. All since this is, this is your baby, but I want to, I want to close it with a question to you. How much better do you feel about the linebacker group this year than you did last year? I, I don't, how do I want to say this? Because the position has been so just terrible for as long as I can remember from the most, the majority of my life as someone who follows the Bengals, the position has been terrible, 
the position itself is not as valuable as Bengals fans think it is, but we our perception of the value of linebacker is exponential because of how bad it's been. I, I think if at least two of these guys that they drafted hit and Pratt develops into a solid player, it 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 doesn't become a problem anymore. It's not like they will have the best linebacking unit in, in, in the league, but you look at successful teams and successful defenses. It's not based around linebacker talent. It's based around pass rushers and people who, and guys who defend the pass at cornerback and you know, that safety linebacker is an afterthought when building a defense, but it's been so much of an afterthought in Cincinnati that we think it's a much more important position than it actually is. I think it, if it just becomes not a liability, not necessarily becoming an asset based off, how the rest of the league is built at linebacker, I think it's fine. And I think they have the capability to do that. So I'm I'm confident that they, they can get to that point with the talent that they finally brought in. It, it just took one year of just completely overhauling the position and maybe even overkilling it in the draft. But I, th- I think they're fine. I think it'll be fine. But just because they're, I think, good at linebacker doesn't mean I think the defense is going to make this in- insane jump because, like again, it, it's the least valuable position on defense. It is. It is, and I think you know the the big thing is if if you can rush rush the passer, if you can rush the passer, that's the big thing. Obviously, stopping the run is a big thing too. But if you can always rush the passer, no matter how good the quarterback is, if you can rush the passer, it, it definitely helps your defense out. The big thing for me though is, you know, the Bengals for much of last year were so awful against the run. Were so they were so awful against. Lamar Jackson and the Ravens offense. It, it was just like, you know, gashing them, gashing them, gashing them. And the linebackers were a big part of the reason why that stuff was occurring. Like you said, if if they can just if they step up and are able to even limit the damage on those fronts and 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 you can kind of toy around with that group and get different things out of them, some sacks from Davis Gaither off the edge, some an interception or two from a guy like Wilson buying, you know, if you can get just different stuff and limit the damage that we saw last year. It's not going to be a top 10 unit, but I think if you can kind of get it to that top half of the league type of status, your team could, it has a chance to be very successful. And, uh, and that's, you know, it doesn't need to be, they don't need to be world beating defense, but if they can limit the damage. I, I think that should it, it kind of be the hope with the additions of this group, but good, good stuff, John, we've got uh, eight more position groups to go, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, if we want to talk about special teams, if we have nothing else to talk about the tenth week, we'll, we can do that too. Okay. Well, maybe it'll turn for turn into a ten for ten. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. But uh, we we wanted to start with linebacker. It was good timing. Well, John, I got to give John credit. This was his uh, segment idea, and it was perfect timing because we had the interview with Marcus Bailey uh, lined up. So it was good stuff. Let's drop the mic and get out of here, John. We're we're well over an hour, so uh, you know. What do you what do you got for us before we get out of here? Uh it's Mother's Week. Or, wow, you know it is Mother's Week. It it's is. Mother, it's it Mother's is. Day on Sunday, but it's really Mother's Week. If you haven't called your mom and told her Happy Mother's Day, if you appreciate her, do that now. Don't don't wait for Sunday. Don't be like the rest of the world that's just waiting for that one day. It's Mother's Week. She deserves that week. My mom actually cut my hair today. They, they I was going to say that that beautiful quaff of yours is, is thanks to your mom, right? They told me it was a bad idea to live with your parents during quarantine when you have nowhere else to go. <laughs> but it ended up working out in the end. Call your mom. Tell her Happy Mother's Week, courtesy of the Orange and Black Insider. Yep. Every day is Mother's Day, right? Every exactly. day is Mother's Day. That's uh, no, well said. I, you know, normally I kind of, I don't know, sometimes I say just different stuff or come up with something weird. I just kind of have a couple of announcements for my mic drop. Number one, I mentioned that, uh, you know, Marcus Bailey joined us courtesy of Carrick Sports. They represent another couple of Bengals. I, I said this, kind of teased it earlier. We're hoping to get a couple more clients of theirs that are on the Bengals and uh, our recent additions Let's just tease it this way. Their names were mentioned a couple of times on this week's episode. Uh, so we are hoping that they, hopefully Marcus goes back and, and gives them, gives us rave reviews. Right. And uh, it will allow the others to come on the program. But uh, we have a couple of others potentially lined up and we're excited about them joining us. We'll definitely give you the names, et cetera, when those things are uh, lined up and ready to go. The other thing I want to, I want to say, John, uh, I, I kind of talked about it with some of the other podcasters in our channel, but I, and I know I'm not like, I'm not one that likes to pat ourselves on the back 
and whatnot. But I have to thank you, thank our other podcasters, Ace, Zim, Daddio, Hoji, Matt Minnick of the channel. This, the SB Nation, Cincy Jungle podcast channel and its episodes were essentially a top 35. And, you know, you could scoff at that, I guess, if you want, but a top 35 iTunes football podcast throughout the month of April. And, uh, you know, it, it's something we work hard at. We brought you, I think, about 25 episodes in draft, the calendar draft week alone between all of us. We've been getting you interviews like Marcus Bailey. TJ Hushmanzada spoke with Ace and Zim recently. We had Anthony Munoz, Dahani Jones. I think Ace and Zim are also speaking with Jeff Blake coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've had a lot of interviews. We've had a lot of episodes. We've tried to make them different and interesting, ranging from listener questions to news updates to interviews and all that kind of stuff. But our show is getting noticed. It's had quite a bit of movement in the iTunes charts for podcasts, football podcasts. So I want to thank my co-host, John, the other podcasters, and all of the listeners for tuning in to not only this program, but the others, leaving a rating, subscribing, et cetera. It's meant a lot. It's a it's a labor of love for us, and we we appreciate that. So I kind of had to brag a little bit, John, about what, what's going on with our shows. The show's a thing because of you. You're, you you were the OG in the show. That's nah, why I, that's why nah. I made you Mike Jordan when, nah. I, did, when I did that Photoshop of, of the 98 Bulls team. Like it, it's it's cool that we have five guys to make up essentially this entire channel. And in, in the month of April, those 25 shows, that's basically a daily podcast. So to see that we could generate those numbers acting like a daily podcast essentially tells me that you guys like us enough for us to be like a legitimate thing. It's it's I love doing the weekly thing. I think it works best for my commitment, essentially. I don't know if I could do a daily thing like they do on Locked On uh, or, or, any, or any other type of major podcast that, that there is covering football. But th to be able to you know look, look back on this month and say we can definitely do it we can definitely keep our head above water and, and even thrive to a certain extent. If we were to do this every day, it, de it definitely means a lot. And obviously it was, uh, um, you know, a, a month for, for traffic, especially with the Bengals, but even still, it was, it was great to see the growth of this podcast. And yeah, I definitely appreciate you guys. Yeah. We, we appreciate uh, it. Yeah. It's, it's great. And um, we, we hope to keep growing. We hope to keep climbing some of that, but uh, it was some news that kind of came our way and I did some research to find out, some of this stuff. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned the other stuff in previous episodes, thousands of downloads per day on average throughout April, um, you know, including uh, that's not even really including the YouTube stuff. So it, it's just, it's been crazy and we are, we're flattered and we we're going to keep giving you stuff. And, um, from, from all of our different hosts, we appreciate it. The other thing I wanted to announce, we will be doing a show on Friday, afternoon we had from our good friend fatal he he asked earlier are you guys taking calls we do still take calls but we usually leave those for standalone listener question episodes because as you can see our show went long tonight with the interview and uh, other things we talked about so adding in listener questions could kind of make it a little long for what a traditional podcast episode is but we want to hear from you this is a listener driven show so we are going to be doing a show on Friday afternoon to talk about the schedule release, go over that, and then we'll open up the phone lines and text lines, email lines, all that kind of stuff. So you can call us on air live, or if you want to, if you're unable to join when we go on air, which I believe will be about 3 p.m. Eastern on Friday, if you're unable to join us then, you can preemptively send us a question you want answered on air. You can always hit us up at... Uh, at Bengals OBI. You can email us the OB insider at gmail.com. Um, leave them here in the chats, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we, we monitor those and then hit us up on the text or call line 949-542-6241. You can get us there. So um, we're going to be doing that. We'll be taking questions then and talking about the schedule as it gets released tomorrow night. Um, John, I hope, I, I think you may be joining us for that. I hope you will. Um, myself, John, hopefully, uh, Daddio. I think Daddio is going to join us, and then Matt Minnick. So uh, we're going to have a little roundtable, have some fun with that. So that's what we've got going on tap, and what's happening with the show. I think that's it, John. Did I miss anything else? 
No, nah, man, if, if the busiest puppet in the world, Daddy O McDo, can make it, then I will certainly give my all to do it as well. <laughs> well, you are, a, you are a busy guy. You say that uh, you don't do a daily podcast, but it seems as if you are just the media, the media mogul, my friend. You are, you are making appearances galore, and um, it's probably because you're a lot smarter than me. So that's why you're in such high demand. Yeah, I've, I've never no comment. No, no, thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, on that note, I guess we will get out of here. Get the show how you can. Subscribe to it if you will. We'll see you Friday. Our thanks to Marcus Bailey once again for joining us at the beginning of the program, as well as to Carrick Sports for helping us arrange that interview and potentially more coming up. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time.